Scoliosis in children, what are the symptoms and treatment options? So when patients think of scoliosis, very often patients think of scoliosis they associate with kids because scoliosis is most commonly diagnosed or thought about within children and adolescents. Unfortunately, the greatest population of scoliosis patients is actually in adults, and it's actually directly related with age. So as patients increase with age, the more likelihood that, that the same age group population will have more incidence of scoliosis. So basically every decade of life, the incidence of scoliosis actually increases by percentage in that patient population. So the highest population or highest percentage of patients are actually in late stage life, 70, 80, 90 year olds are much more common uh, to have scoliosis than patients that, that are children. But when we think of scoliosis, we think about scoliosis affecting children and adolescent because that's when scoliosis is actually the most progressive. Now, scoliosis and the most common type of scoliosis that we see in children is something called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. This is the AIS. And this is typically diagnosed between 10 and 18 years of age. Idiopathic is a very fancy way of saying we don't know what's causing it. It means unknown cause, and there's not a clearly associated single cause. We believe idiopathic scoliosis in the adolescent form can be multifactorial, meaning there could be many factors that a patient is developing that's causing the scoliosis to actually develop. Even though scoliosis is diagnosed in the adolescent stage, we actually believe it occurs younger in life, sometime in their juvenile, juvenile years, that causes the small curve to develop, but it actually starts progressing during growth, and in the stage it's when it's diagnosed. Now there are some other types of scoliosis that definitely affect children. One is infantile scoliosis. Infantile scoliosis can also be idiopathic, it can be congenital, and it can also be another type called neuromuscular. Now I already described what idiopathic scoliosis is, but congenital scoliosis is when a patient is actually born with scoliosis and it actually develops in utero. And this is when a bone of the spine doesn't fully develop properly and develops into something called a hemivertebra. This hemivertebra is a malformed bone within the spine that can lead to a curve developing. And normally this is diagnosed, can be diagnosed early in life if the hemivertebra is senior, severe enough and the, the curve it develops as a result is visible enough. However, many patients go with congenital scoliosis and they're not diagnosed later on in life into their juvenile years or even their adolescent years. But infantile scoliosis is classically between zero and three. Now, once you get into this uh, three years of age, but less than 10, this is where we call this juvenile scoliosis. Now, very often this is diagnosed or the word is used early onset. Now, juvenile scoliosis can have all, all categories as well. It can have congenital, can have idiopathic, can have neuromuscular. And these cases, they call it early onset because normally when a scoliosis is diagnosed, it has to be a certain size. Normally curves that are five or 10 degrees are very difficult to, to see. But if you start having a 25, 30, 35, 40, 50 degree curve in a juvenile case, they call this early onset or early progression. And early onset or early progression of scoliosis is a poor, is a bad indicator because we know curves progress most likely during adolescent growth spurts. So if the curves are already progressing in this stage, it can be progressing, uh, it gives it more room and more time to progress. Now, the last one I wanna mention there is something called neuromuscular scoliosis. I mentioned congenital, well neuromuscular scoliosis is when a patient has a neuromuscular condition. Now in a neuromuscular condition, they have a, another condition that could be leading to the curve, something like cerebral palsy, something like Marfan syndrome, something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, something that affects the, neuro, the, the muscular system or the tissues of the body, or something affecting the nerve system in the body. Any of those types, whether it be idiopathic, congenital, or neuromuscular, we know scoliosis is progressive, and it's its very nature to worsen over time, particularly left untreated. And all three of those cases, the biggest trigger for progression, or when we associate scoliosis progression, is growth. That the amount of progression is directly related to growth and growth is more likely to affect a bigger curve than a smaller curve. So as curves become bigger, they're more likely to progress as patients grow. And adolescence is by far the most risky phase because that's when most progression or most growth occurs. This is when the majority of patients go through something called their growth spurt or their pubescent growth spurt. And at this stage at life is when curves have the ability to progress the fastest and the quickest. Now, how fast can a curve progress during this 
rapid phase of progression during adolescence. Well, the variable the number is unknown. There's no way to predict how much your curve will progress or how much it can progress during this stage. But we know in children during this adolescent stage is when they do progress the most. The fastest progression I've seen or the most uh, has been, I've seen curves progress 60 degrees in less than six months in an untreated patient. I've seen curves also progress 20 degrees in four to six weeks in an untreated patient. So, there were, so these curves can have rapid progression in this stage. And this is also a reason why we believe, we believe scoliosis affects girls more often than boys because girls go through an earlier growth spurt and they go through a faster one, meaning their growth spurt is like two years. It's typically you know, 11, 12 to 13 or 14, where boys tend to go through a growth spurt anywhere between 13 years of age to about 18. So they have a much slower, longer growth rate and they tend to grow go through the growth spurt later on in life. And we believe something with posture maturity could have something to do with it, but we really don't know. Remember, it's idiopathic. We really don't know why it's happening. But scoliosis in children is when it's most often diagnosed and there's when they're most often treated. So each scoliosis case is very different and unique and it has necessitates, necessitates its own customized treatment approach. But treatment plans are crafted around typically the patient age, the condition type, the severity, and where the curve is actually located. So as curves get bigger and the, the, the treatment options become more, more intense in terms of how we're dealing with it. Effective treatment can include monitoring for, for progression, but normally in conservative treatment approaches, we want to treat scoliosis cases in a much smaller size. And the reason why, because conservative treatment approaches are designed to stop curves from progressing to surgical standards. However, Traditional treatment approaches tend to have less treatment options for smaller curves, and they just tend to wait for curves to become bigger and then try to treat them with surgery at that severe state. So modifying your treatment approach to meet your needs and also the unique challenges of that person, whether it's an infant, a juvenile, or an adolescent is also very important because we know the younger a patient has surgery, meaning not gone through their adolescent growth spurt, the more likely they're gonna need multiple surgeries over their lifetime, and they may need different types of surgeries, meaning surgeries that involve uh, growing rods or magnetic releasing rods, which can have their own different host of complications. So one treatment approach in very, very severe cases with younger, younger patients, meaning juvenile or infantile, is to control their curve just until they get old enough past adolescent stage to they can only have one surgery, not multiple. So combining these different treatment options to get the very best approach is a one way to manage scoliosis. But the best way is to try to deal, deal with a, a scoliosis treatment approach that's gonna avoid surgery altogether. And these different approaches are normally conservative treatment options that are, just, uh, that are using multiple treatment options like scoliosis, chiropractic care, in-office therapy, custom prescribed home exercises, and corrective bracing. When we combine all these things into a conservative approach that the goal is not just to slow curve progression or watch it to get it worse, but to physically reduce the size of the curve, so therefore you never need bracing, are some of the best approaches to managing your scoliosis and having a less effect, the scoliosis having a less effect on children. So what are some of the earliest signs that scoliosis can be occurring either in children or adolescents or even juvenile cases? The first and foremost sign in scoliosis in children is asymmetry. It's posture asymmetry. It's gonna be shoulders on level, hips on level, waist on level, ro rib rotation, something postural. It will not be pain. It will more, more likely not be dysfunction within the body. It's gonna be postural issues. Very often these posture issues can develop while the patient is going through puberty growth spurts. And typically when patients go through puberty growth spurts, they tend to wear bigger clothes, they tend to cover themselves, and it's not, you don't, they're not, they're turning from, you know, children into adults. So you don't see your kids running around like, you know, like in their underwear like they did before, because they're kind of just growing, they're becoming more adult. So you tend to miss it. And since it's happening all at the same time, these curves can progress, like I said, very quickly, and they go from no, no diagnosis into a significant diagnosis within a matter of months. So therefore, don't take posture asymmetry lightly. It's not normal to have posture asymmetry in children. There's nothing normal about that. If you see any type of posture asymmetry in, a, in your child or in, in children in general, point it out to the parent or point it out to your pediatrician, say, look, there's something not right. Like the shoulders are not level, the hips aren't level, the ribs aren't level. Don't think it's gonna go away because it may be scoliosis and every month you're waiting, the curve has a chance to progress. So here at Scoliosis Reduction Center, we offer very proactive treatments for all ages of patients and especially 
um, infantile, juvenile, and adolescent types of scoliosis. And the goal, since we know children and adolescents are at a risk for rapid progression, we like to reduce curves before the rapid phase of progression actually occurs. So early detection and proactive treatment is a gives us a much higher success rate. However, unfortunately, my average patient that walks in my office that's a child or adolescent, unfortunately, is a severe scoliosis. They've already been told that they're facing surgery because they did exactly what the traditional model is, which is nothing until the curve becomes severe enough where they're now they're recommending surgery, and now they want to get their curve below those levels. And we're successful at reducing severe curves below surgical threshold, but we much rather reduce curves before they become surgical because we get a much smaller curve at that size and much less impact on the body. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.